so what are the keys to all this chaos? Uh, so I want to bring out two of my favorite people, Christine Richards, our research director, and Peter Kelly Detwiller, Forbes Northridge Partners. All right, guys, so it's over. How did, how, you know, how do you feel it went? I think uh, we got a pretty clear sense there's going to be a lot of chaos for some time to come. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I mean, it was just interesting to see all the conversations, and there was a lot of discussion around innovation, you know, and who plays a role in really driving that innovation. Yeah. I thought that was a huge part of the conversation. Here. You know, one other thing, Drew, when yeah. one of the conversations, of the person sitting next to me in the audience, this is when um, in San Antonio, that utility was talking about what they were doing. And she commented that that all happens within the context of a regulatory framework. And we had that, that talk, that popped up a lot during the conversations is how do we as a society decide what we want for ourselves and for our kids and our grandchildren? And how do we set up the rules in the sandbox so that people innovate and try and create business models and do the right things that help everybody else out? Yeah. And when we don't have a clear set of rules. It's not a zero sum game. Anymore. No, it doesn't have to be. But, but if the rules are such that some incentives push you in this direction, other ones push you that way, like we heard from yesterday from Gordon Van Welly at ISO New England, now you get a real recipe for chaos because there isn't even a unidirectional you know, flow to the thing, yeah. right? Now you start to see more of a zero-sum opportunity because it's not even clear where we're all headed. Wow, that's a good point. But so, oh. oh, I was going to say, there's even a, a balance going on, though. Um, there's a great, I've been doing video interviews, which you'll see um, coming out over the next couple of weeks, but um, someone there made a great point about this, this balance that's going on between innovation and you know, a lot of startups, you know, a lot of excitement, there are a lot of really cool technologies that are out there, but we're putting them in a mission critical environment. You know? yeah. So how do you kind of drive that innovation while making sure it's going to be safe and secure and you know, it is going to be reliable for the grid? Yeah. It was just a, an interesting balance to hear about. Guys, you guys have been here all week. It's been incredible to have you. Please, what, what was your takeaway? Gavin. Oh. How are you? Oh. <laughs> Can we get a microphone over to you? Or tell, tell us one, one or two things that you found relevant, and we'll just write it on the board. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of service, and I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of issues pertaining to each of the business model. So, you know, Google developed all these new, these new innovative opportunities in the future, whether it is, you know, rooftop solar plus storage, whether it's a microgrid or something else. You know, we have, you know, Tom that, she was saying, we want, we think we have a role deploying and owning ourselves. Um, yeah. And then, you, know, you talk to energy, next to energy as well, and there's service provider. And they say, well, we think we have a role in you know, deploying microgrids and efficiency services and ourselves as well. Yeah. So there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different entities trying to do similar things in the market. And I think the best, um, the best kind of uh, dis distillation that I heard from it was actually from the head of the city who said there's a lot of Competition. Yeah. Is it a love hate thing or are they actually really like all working towards something though? Like the same thing. Are they on the same sheet music or what? What I would hope is that they're all working towards a cleaner grid to set the tide for the And I think that that's really, you know, the, that's hopefully why we're all right? Yeah. Um, I rem it reminds me of, like, in the Crusades, the people that made money were the ones that sold the water canteens, the 
you know, swords and everything. The people that actually were setting about this enterprise actually lost power. But the people that were selling them them services became very, essentially the Medici's and everyone else. So it's an interesting step ladder that we're on in this evolution. Who else had a finding that was surprising for them? Oh, someone? Oh. <laughs> bunch of people here. Yeah, a bunch of people. It seems like. Jeff, how are you? So my name is Jeff Mucci with RCR Wireless News, and I came here um, hoping to understand the utility uh, sector's understanding of smart cities, smart buildings, smart homes, and how uh, communications can really be an enabler of uh, new revenue streams, new business models. And so I guess two observations. One, you look at Chattanooga that really built a communications company. I love that you bring them generating up. Generating yeah. $130 million a year and um, uh, has really been an enabler for them to really introduce and innovate. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are a lot of cities and utilities here that uh, perhaps don't see communications as a tool to um, unleash new revenue opportunities like analytics and such. So uh, hmm. for me, it's just really informative, but I think there's a bit of a gap there between utilities and, and how communications uh, really does tie into smart cities. And at the end of the day, utilities and cities own some of the most important infrastructure elements, right of ways, light poles, that sort of thing. And so. I hope they don't get too caught up in, gee, we can't afford to invest. Well, it may be they need to invest so they can innovate and create new business models. Because ZPB is going to sell access to that to Google, Facebook, and everyone else, and they're going to make a ton of money, and that's going to go into the public benefit. But you just wrote a great report about this called Mind the Gap that sort of that touches on a lot of your world. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, the, the other thing is, you know, we, we know that there's going to be an IT wrapper around everything, yeah. right? Because the main trend here is, in my opinion, is we're moving into this phase where we're substituting intelligence for raw materials, right? We're doing things smarter and better because we have more data that tells us what we're doing and how to do it and how to focus things. So a classic example is when you leave the room in a network lighting situation, you know, LEDs, the lights go off because, you know, if the tree falls in the forest and no one's there, what's the point? So directionally focused energy mm. and a convergence of you know, once you end up building one network for something, like we talked about the internet today, don't build another one. Figure out mm -hmm. how you integrate, Innovate how you optimize, adapt. right? Yeah. And so it's going to be really messy, but I do think we'll find the lanes of traffic starting to, you know, come in and drive down the same highway eventually. So I think I heard coopetition from Gavin, and how do we sort of crystallize sort you of know, There's what a convergence is. piece of it. Right? Yeah, and there's so a big data play piece of it. So big data convergence, but like monetizing this investment, yeah. like. I think, it's, I think it's the business years. model. What is the business yeah. model? What is the business model? I think model one of the biggest constraints when you had some of the other CEOs up there yesterday, one of the biggest constraints was what is the business model? Yeah. So how do you make that investment? What are the revenue streams? How's it going to affect your exis existing embedded business? I think Let's there keep are the microphones a lot of, on the speakers also, by the way. Sorry. A lot of opportunities for utilities because they have put out, you know, this infrastructure and communication networks where, you know, water utilities, I mean, they can start to tap into some of those networks, you know, transportation authorities. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, utilities have that infrastructure. Telecommunication companies have that infrastructure already. So how can we start to tap into those networks that are already available and be able to leverage them? So I'm on the smart building side, and there are some initiatives in our uh, smart building side from the consumption side is that standardization. To create value easier, we need standardization and tagging models. And I have learned that there is no such a thing on the generation and the distribution side. And for to create the competition, there needs to be standardization. It's hmm. a good point. So standardization is... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we <laughs> the chaos survey, I mean, yeah. the last year, all of us have, yeah. the three of us have been talking to each other, it's just yeah. like the regulatory and the standards. Well, that was the core yeah. of ETS well, Chicago. When, when, you, yeah. when, you're, when you're ISO and you're RTO, right, they don't even have the same name for the same thing. Yeah. Or the Iowa what a good Utilities point. Board <laughs> and everyone else is a PUC. Yeah. I mean, I can't even look at this piece of fruit and agree with you that it's a tomato. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We have different nomenclature for all that stuff. Then you look at things like, when you're trying to figure out data, is, is one And yet the, the, yeah. the vendors are global, yeah. though. Yeah. They're yeah. universal. Right. So and it's yeah. like... And then there's the data, like, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Is that our ending, 1,300? Or is it our beginning, 1,200, right? Even things like that, and you only find out after you unintentionally trip a piece of equipment or turn something off in an automated DR environment an hour earlier or an hour later than you wanted to, 
<laughs> I mean, that's the kind of stuff we still have to work through in many cases. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and we also, what, did we, what else do we hear? We heard, and you talk about this, fetishizing technology, yeah. right? Put the person back in the middle of this thing. And we are also heard a lot from, from people was, ah, oh, we've got customers. They're not rate payers, they're customers, and we gotta really think about. And not every rate payer is a customer, not no, every that's customer true. is a rate payer. Yeah. And that yeah. we're, like, this is a larger system. It doesn't end at your service there. Yeah. Um, I saw a hand raised from a few people, but actually, if it's okay, our, our friend from Kansas, I, I actually really enjoyed our conversation. Do you mind, uh, Jamin, bringing it up to him? You mentioned that your peak was agricultural, and I found that really interesting, but, um, you know, this is a national conversation. It doesn't only happen in cities. What was your perspective? I would say from from the position that we're in as a as a generation transfer. Sorry, please share oh, where you're sorry. at. My bad. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. do that. <laughs> My bad. Ron Chartier, I'm from Sunflower Electric Power Corporation. We serve about eighty percent of western Kansas. So I, I would say my perspective is you know, going back to the ratepayers, the ratepayers own us, you know, at, at a certain level. Members. We'll, yeah. <laughs> We, we, will, we will continue to, you know, strive to do what they need. And, you know, some of the issues brought up here, you know, the, the deer, the DERs and, and that sort of thing, we're actually starting to see some of that come about, you know, in our service territories. And... Do you think you, know, you have more agility to do that kind of thing because you don't have 17 committees and 19 different departments to work through and cooperatives? I don't know if you all know, but if you're at a cooperative and you have a job, you officially have like 17 jobs. Like you basically, you know what I mean? It's just so much more we're all in kind of ethos. So is that, does that make it easier or harder to sort of figure this stuff out together? Well, yeah, that, that's a great point because not only do I understand billing and generation, I also understand transmission and rate making and and those sorts of things. So, you know, and we're fairly progressive. I mean, we get involved in some projects that are, you know, hey, you're here. <laughs> cutting yeah. edge and, and out there. But at the same time, we, we still have to provide that low, reliable cost power to to our consumers, so. Okay, well out of curiosity, what does an agricultural peak look like? Is that just a lot of water systems operating and turbines and, well turbines wouldn't even be on that. What, what, yeah, no, what is an um, agricultural peak? Um, so, our, so our peak is typically late afternoon because we, we do have some retail. Okay. So there's air conditioning load and that okay. sort of thing. But you know, our, our minimum load is probably in the, the 450 range megawatts. Uh -huh. And in the summer when everybody's irrigating corn and, and those sorts of things in this arid climate that we're in, you know, we'll, we'll double our minimum peak. We'll wow. be up in the 900, 950 range, so. Wow. I appreciate that, I was just really curious about that. I think that. it's really interesting because we talk a lot about smart cities uh, but I mean, rural a lot areas of cooperatives at this conference, and, right? and telecommunications and agriculture. I mean, it, the telecommunications is what enables a lot of the, you know, change for rural areas and their, their ability to survive, yeah. you know, in, in the long run. So, I mean, I think that's a, that's a huge area that we probably didn't talk that, about enough. That reminds me of on, on MLK Day, uh, we were all sending quotes out to each other. And one of the things I saw was letters from Birmingham jail where, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. just said it, it is just, it is the fact of nature that I can only be as good as I am if you are as good as you are. And that's not just in our personal relationship, but that is in everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so only as much, those nodes and sensors, yeah, we may think of, oh great, we're gonna put them in cities and our cities are gonna have dope street lights, right? But that same technology can be applied in so many different applications, right? And it's just, we haven't really thought about the full range of really how this can serve everyone yet. Oh, yeah. Nodes and sensors was a huge thing. I think I heard that in every single panel, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Like, forget yeah. the day where we yeah. didn't hear nodes and sensors yeah. in a conversation about anything. And right? that they're going to be almost without cost. Right, and they're yeah. going to, like, yeah. but you can't improve what you can't measure, <laughs> right. and it's like right. you need it, right? So it's going to be the governance and accounting is really kickstarting all of this. And then the, then the critical thing is what do you do with that torrent of data? Right. How yeah. do you take How do you manage it? How do you actually get it, value out of it instead of just making shelf art? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. and how do you access and, and what does that imply for the power grid? I mean, we're going to be using and processing just tons of data that we're not doing today. And that, that has some significant implications for where you're locating your data centers yeah. and what's going on with it. Think them. about all the computing opportunity we have if we just clouded up all the meters in a city like Austin. Oh, hi. And since we just yeah. push that information about yeah. every four hours yeah. with 15 minute interval data, it's like if we actually use that access point for all the rest of the day when it's not pushing data to be a supercomputer, like all these millions of access points yeah. to just make everything operate so, so much smoother. We just haven't enabled this yet. We haven't, I don't even know who's creating a KPI around that. Hive you know? is working on that. You okay. know? Because um, every uh, meter has 99% of the time it's not using. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. just useless. So you basically take all these multiple so cores expensive. and you could, if I were to be diagnosed with cancer tomorrow and I needed a genomic therapy, th those machines could be networked to do that. Say what? If I needed a specific genomic therapy for my cancer, my specific diagnosis, you could right now go to a giant cray and pay a lot of money to create a genomic therapy that's just mine, okay. yeah. right, for my DNA. What, what these guys are saying is, go grab all those smart meters. You don't need the information immediately, so it doesn't have to be like a supercomputer, and have them crunch on it when they're not sending information back to the utility the rest of the time when it's idle, right? Could be one of the biggest supercomputers in the world. Dude, if we right had all of our smart meters up. on a single yeah. Yeah. connectivity, that yeah, would so be the best It's like set to, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, yeah. where you can actually have your computer networked in with everyone else's. Yeah, it's, so. it's that distributed versus exactly. centralized yeah. intelligence. It's the third so. industrial revolution, as Ann yeah. Promajori yeah. brought yeah. up. And so, my old yeah. boss, Jeremy Rifkin, but and, whatever. And so one of the <laughs> things I think we're going to see, and I see this all the time writing for Forbes, is we thought we were going to do X, and then we realized, oh, this technology was way better for Y. In fact, I talked one time with the, Twitter. the chief commercial technology officer at MIT, and I said, what would be the thing that most surprised me about your job? And he says, every technology that came out of the lab that we knew had a commercial possibility, not once was our original intent the thing where we actually made the money. And I think what we're going to find on this journey going forward is yeah. there are a lot of delightful and sometimes not so much surprises out there where a use case popped up we didn't know. Look at electric vehicles. Five years ago, we yeah. thought we were going to charge them all at night because we were going to flatten right? out the curve. Yeah. Now we look at the California duck curve and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We better charge those things during the daytime to I suck all the solar power I remember out. the camelback curve. Yeah, yeah. And, and then release that power back into the grid in the evening. So the use case changed just in five years. Or, or like smart meters. I mean, covering that for the past decade where initially smart meters, oh, we're going to you know, do hourly pricing and, and no more, you know, meter yeah. readers and, and that, that sort of thing. And yeah. how much is that unlocked? I mean, how yeah. much is that changed to where we are today and all the possibilities that are with that? So it's I'd like to ask a question cool. of the audience. Next year, this time, what's going to be the biggest change in the conversation from this year? Mm. What will we say was, oh, here was, here was the delta. Does anyone have a thought as to, you know, what's going to be that theme du jour a year from now that we might not have discussed this year, aside from the, the general election? Roger, do you have a thought? Uh, I uh, you do. <laughs> so Roger does a lot of, he's one of our research analysts, and he, get, he looks through reams and reams and reams of stuff annually. So, I mean, just th thinking about that, anything that you see sort of, pop up from today and these three days. Or what days? about the, the customer? I Here, mean, you're very microphone. focused on the customer oh. piece of it. I, I have a, a couple of takeaways, and my focus recently has been on the customer. Um, something that was said a little bit in an earlier session was thinking about the customer from an energy advisor standpoint makes a lot yeah. of sense to me. Uh, that was Chris Eukster, I think. Being yeah, it was. Yeah. was. I actually had found that surprising from Muni. Another takeaway for me from a customer orientation was that uh, another panel said, when we think about customer satisfaction, it's best to think about a nominal scale, that is compared to all the other industries, rather than just looking at another electric utilities mm -hmm. ratings, but compare customer satisfaction against the best scale. And that made a lot of sense to me. Uh, w one thing that I didn't see in this year's presentation, and it's kind of important as we roll out new products and new services, is, and it's a different way of looking at, at the industry, and that is, and there are a lot of smart people in this area. 
and that is how do you best market energy options? Uh, I, I don't. As in, like, sort of customizing to different, like, sub demographic groups or markets? Or? Yeah, and, and one of the things we've noticed in our surveys for Z Prime is that there are market differences among demographic groups. Yeah. Things appeal and, and apply to women different than men. Uh, people who are low income uh, have different needs and low income is the most diverse market segment of the population that could be generational families it could be students it could be it, it, the, it there's so much more richness that hasn't been unearthed in the low income market than we give it credit for so so making uh, a uh, suggestion maybe for uh, ETS 17 maybe having some marketing experts in this area I like that, that. That's that a really would good idea. Yeah. tell the utilities, hey, listen, if you want to reach some segment, this is what works. So TXU, their free nights program has gone, gone bang, gangbusters. But what's interesting, you know the place that they actually figured that out? They, they took over an old ad agency's building. And it was almost like the location and the kind of work environment it was fostered more creative thinking. And it was an interesting thing. So, I mean, advertising didn't directly lead to it for them, but it was sort of that osmosis of being in that kind of environment, I feel like, that did lend itself to it. That's a really good point. Thank you for that. Yeah, that was excellent. There was one right back up, right back up there. Hey, Gary. This is our executive utility council member from Austin, so I can't say anything bad about Austin City Council. Good, right please don't. <laughs> um, Kerry Furchill, I'm with the Austin Electric Utility Commission. We're essentially the management board for Austin Energy. Um, I think what you're going to have next year is a, uh, and it, it follows along this same path, is a massive realization, and you're going to be addressing this much more, of uh, how, how different customers actually are. Um, yes. And, and what those customers need, frankly. Yes implies completely different approach to the grid. So I have customers who would like the grid to be structured in one way, and I have a whole hell of a lot of other customers Samsung. who use an equivalent amount of energy who right. want to see it addressed in a different way. Yeah. Uh, you know, and some of this comes from, I, I guess I, I have two, two things that are uh, uh, driving the way I look at this. Um, Austin Energy is a regulated, by the city council uh, utility island in the middle of a gigantic deregulated state. And we have to both deal with the deregulated energy only market of ERCOT that we sell into our, sell our generation into and buy it out of. Uh, and what, what works for ERCOT doesn't necessarily always work for us and vice versa. Uh, and then secondly, within our community, uh, we have everything from hundreds of thousands of small uh, homeowners and apartment dwellers who have energy profiles all their own. And I have S Samsung and uh, NXP and massive users who have not one interest in common really with my consumers. Uh, the consumers basically want cool air and light. Increase comfort, reduce cost. Yeah, and they don't really care what the rate is as long as it doesn't cost them a lot to run their household. Samsung just wants massive quantities of incredibly cheap energy. Uh, and those are not easy to, to make Balance. work yeah. in a single in a single system. Carrie, can we, you pull up then? And, and, and you have to look on, put, wear your public policy hat on this, please. And also, I, one of our advisors on the research paper that Chris Smith uh, led at uh, LBJ school when we were there. Um, Carrie, so, you know, Christine and I have been really interested in the cultural and generational divide, not only socially, but how the energy industry really reflects something of a, an awakening of sort of, I, I feel like we do work in an industry at Austin Energy, eight of my 10 bosses were women, right? And so I, I felt like that was encouraging. And so where we had this role before of, I guess what I'm saying is the diversity of who we have to serve is reflected now more in our industry, and that's encouraging. But 
that income inequality, that economic inequality, is that something that we need to bring up because it's impacting the lives of our energy equation? Like, literally, I, I mean, we, are we saying we need to do a panel on the dynamism of the low income market just to bring it to the rest of our industry's attention? Like, because I think we'll do that if that's something we need to do. Well, I don't I, know if everyone's thinking about that yet. I, I want to encourage you to do that, but that has nothing to do really with the, the point I'm trying to make. What I'm getting at is the actual needs of a lot of your customers are diametrically opposed to yeah. the actual yes. needs of some of your other customers. Yeah. And if what we're trying to do is create a universal grid and a universal uh, transmission and distribution system and a universal generation uh, method that serves everybody, you have to take into account the dynamic of you know what serves one doesn't necessarily serve the rest, and you know what that ultimately ends up mean, meaning in the electric utility business is not very very hard to figure out. Anybody who's ever been through a rate hearing, it cost us X to run the system. Now we need to allocate it amongst all this heterogeneous uh, group of customers, and 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 that that is being that which was always complex is becoming much more complex as chaos ensues. Yeah. So Rolling Stones, we're gonna walk out to you. You can't always get what you want next year. There we and go. Let's <laughs> hope yeah. that the industry respects that, so yeah. yeah. So it's, it's interesting, so there, Peter, we were talking about this yesterday about sort of like, we used to acknowledge that there's a public good and there's a private good, but that there was also a communal good. Yeah. And it seems like we're just stripping that part from a lot of the conversation until we get to a place like this where everyone's like, oh no, I know I need collaboration in my life. So it's interesting that that, di that diametric opposition doesn't necessarily need to be there. A lot of times we think we know what we want, but it's actually just the, the embodiment of what we thought we wanted. But if we keep talking about it, there's this third path that works for both of us. Usually again, building good faith and trust leads to a better agenda. Well, that certainly helps. You don't get anywhere without the dialogue. You know what I think a lot of people are attracted to the conference, in my opinion, is like yesterday I talked to someone, I said, what's your undergrad? And they said, philosophy. Yeah. I said, this conference must be awesome for you because really a lot of this is all about economic justice. It's about how do we treat different classes of individuals and groups fairly within society? How do we attain you know, the decarbonization goal? Electrons touch everybody without us ever being hit by a cattle prod, right? Yeah. They're, they're invisible, and yet <laughs> they affect us all the time everywhere. It's, it's, that's why I find this industry so utterly fascinating, because it's at the, right? Yeah. The it, juncture of everything. And it's people that make it interesting. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Yeah. I think, totally. Tim, yeah. Tim, you had a quote that you had uh, shared on Twitter that uh, you know physics is physics is easy, but soci sociology is hard. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are electrons <laughs> moving around, and we can make that happen. But it's the people <laughs> aspect that makes it, yeah. you know. Well, it was a quote that yes, you. The first day, yeah, uh, I thought. Uh, physics is. I just, we'll get the direct I just pulled it up. Physics <laughs> is easy. Human behavior is hard. Something like that. Yeah, so I mean the sociology, all those different things. In science, when human behavior enters the equation, things go non-linear. Yes. That's why physics is hard, yeah. and yeah. sorry, physics is easy and sociology is hard. I love yeah. that. I love yeah. that. <laughs> love that. I thought and that was good. Can I get an international perspective? Uh, Mr. Patterson back there, can you get? Anything from, uh, so you live north of the Great White Wall and winter is coming. So oh, wow. how do you guys survive in Canada with all the snow? It's a very good question. And uh, the answer is we come to Austin to uh, hang <laughs> out away. and enjoy the great weather. Run away. Thank, Thank you, ETS 2016. Great job, guys. Uh, what, any thoughts uh, as you've been listening in? Uh, from, an, from, an inter, from a non-American perspective, do you think that the, the fact that this conversation is happening is encouraging, or is it similar to what's happening in Canada? Any thoughts there? Uh, another good question, and I think the panel that was up before where you had some representation from Israel, Mexico, and different parts of the states, it was fascinating that there was a similar conversation going on in all of these places, yeah. but that what did you call it? The cooperative coopetition. Coopetition. Trademark Gavin Bay Utility. Though. And how you said <laughs> the 
the regulators and in terms of uh, having consistent, I guess, policy guidelines and frameworks to, to guide the industry yeah. and how that causes this chaos. I, I think um, probably there needs to be a, a greater, not just international engagement, and I'm happy that you did that as part of this conference, but even internally within the United States, creating that consistency and pushing that movement forward, I think will go towards developing uh, positive solutions for everybody. Great, thank you very much. Any last thoughts? We have about two or three minutes before we just call it all a wrap. I know you don't wanna go, but you can't stay here. Um, any last closing thoughts from any of our guests about things they'd like to see for next year? Here's a hand. Yeah, we're bringing the microphone over to you. AI is coming, get ready. AI is coming? Artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something that. Um... We're all replaceable. I, I did learn, <laughs> I, an old friend at Schlumberger told me that. He was like, yeah, you know, the Schlumberger, like 10 years, like two years. He's like, you know, everyone's replaceable. So that is interesting, but you may not just be replaced with 46 chromosomes, it may be ones and zeros. But I mean, artificial intelligence is something that's, it's been around, you know. We've talked about for it for a years. while, the concept's been there. And you know, there are a lot of people that are still involved in the process of actually making that, that happen. So yeah. I think like last year we saw with IBM Watson where, um, and I can't remember, I'm terrible at remembering names. Rob, hi. Rob, and he said, well, we should be okay for at least the next several decades, so. <laughs> it was a thing that... That's good for us. Yeah, it's yeah. good for us. Yeah. No, but I think Don't it's something that... Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's a thing that's good for science fiction and all of that, but I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, like we saw in the survey around chaos, that, um, you know, the roles of people are going to change, and, you know, there are more valuable positions that, that are coming up, and, you know, it's not, it's not all bad. It's not all doom and gloom. What's your headline from ETS? So one thing I'd like to see on badges is how many times you've been here. Yeah. And, reason, and my, mm. here's my lead in on that, right? As I walked into this thing on Tuesday, it was like, oh, haven't seen you since last year. Oh, what's going on? You know, there was this it's almost freeze-dried community that was just waiting for the people to enter in. That's awesome. That knew each other from the last time or the time before. And it gets bigger and it gets bigger and one person we were standing outside the direct house, and I met her here last year. We had a conversation for an hour last year outside Robbie. the direct house. Robbie, <laughs> right? I saw that. So, so she comes outside, and she goes, have you been in the house? I said, yep, sorry, already been inside. She goes, what? You went without me? We, this is where we met. I said, yep. She goes, was there a woman in there? And I said, yeah, there was, but she didn't mean anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> But it was like our conversation picked up right where it left off last year, That's except great. there was a year's worth of growth and things she was working on and I, I was that. working on. And that repeated itself again and again and again over the last 70 some odd hours. And that's what I love about this place is the, the it, it configures itself a little bit different, but people come back, the community grows, the conversation gets deeper and more intense. That's, you call, you that's called a great You the spirit part. of generosity at Chicago, yeah, and I think that's right. It's a spirit of generosity. We need to have yeah. the pins, and you can have, you can wear, yeah, you, like, you can wear the flair. Yeah, or like, so you know, the football players who make a good play and they get the extra thing on their helmet, like, nice, but I don't think thing. we'll do pink next year. I think pink was special for this year. I think well, that's why really then special. you have the pink pin when you come oh, back. Nice, I like oh, that. Yeah. See how that works? Can we do zebra for Z Prime next year? Just everything zebra? Let's do it. I like it. All right. Yeah, all right. Yes. <laughs> all okay. right. Guys, any last comments from y'all? Anything that you request from us that we can do a better job? We got can always do better. There. Oh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, Security. convergences with other things. We. Yeah. Great, so security and transportation. Um, awesome, is it cool? I, if we, you and I were talking about this earlier, I, and I really agree with you, I love that Shaylin brought that lens of transportation really to home and energy. Michael Weber did the same thing with water and energy. 
But I think we can go deeper into those milieus. We can also go deeper into advanced manufacturing. We can also go deeper into waste. We can go deeper into a lot of places that'll touch a lot of lives. Do you think that there's gonna be room at some point for agriculture to be in this conversation? Our food supply. Mm. And the voice It's already in it, yeah. probably. <laughs> Say that again, sorry. Sustainable energy product design. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. And perhaps more customers, right? Not just the end use ones you talked about before, yeah. but who are some of those voices out there? Yeah. We talked about a lot on panels like, oh, we're discovering the customers. Yeah. Well, you know, a panel on, okay, here, here's who we are. Here's what we look like. Here's how we think about electricity. Yeah. Here's how we used to think about it. Here's the tools we're seeing out there now. Here's what's going on in our heads. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like my headline from this event was one, the, it, one it's a new generation of generation. Like it, we are not going back to that past. No. It's gonna be diversified, it's gonna be dynamic. And the other part is the consumer is at the center of everything that emerges next. And that this, is, this whole platform is around the consumer of the future. I feel like that's my personal perspective and I helped create the content, but I also didn't tell everyone what to say. Those, and collaboration really. I mean, underscore yeah. of everything was figuring this out with the people that you trust and built, and finding out who you trust and who you don't trust, yeah. right? Christine, any highlights for you? I Last think just that quiz. innovation piece and that it's, it's not gonna be just one you know, company or one organization, it's gonna take a whole group of people and you know a whole set of partnerships to make all this happen. It's Love critical. It. We have one more. One more mm -hmm. question, please, by all means. Oh, it's not a question, it's going back to what you were saying for next year. I know yeah. this year you kind of touched on it, which was really great. I think one of you, I think one of your first speakers, it was Michael Legat. Michael Leggett, the most right. important component on the grid is the human. Exactly, and I yeah. think that's very important. Um, the human component, not just within our customer base, but also Good within point. the utility itself. So and not the customer, but yeah, but the human. Right, As it, because one of the important things he talks about was about how stress affects the brain and then yeah. your yeah. ability to actually function and, and, uh, and be productive and creative, which is exactly what we need our, our workforce to be able to do. And as well, so you caught Paula Gold Williams' point earlier today yeah, about the culture, great, right? I exactly. Mean, truly, and the next thing was all those people were able to try this because she's like, "Hey, no, we figured out the budgeting and the finance. You're good. Do what you got to do to help our customers, help our rate, help all that." Like, right? You're exactly. Because right. I had so an there's less conversation stress. as well. So that standpoint, from a wellness standpoint, which is one of the big wellness. thrusts wow. that Jamaica Public Service Company that we're doing in terms of our employ for exactly that reason. And also the culture piece, because, and I apologize in advance to any systems engineers who might be in here who <laughs> are about to butcher your concept. But from what I understand from systems engineering, um, a system is more than just the um, combination of its different elements. You also have to look at the interactions. So if you have a system and you have all these different elements and you, the system is not behaving in the way that you want it to behave, and you keep, out, switch, keep on switching all the elements like, if your system, for example, is the is a utility, and you're like, oh, it's not working properly, let me switch out the CEO, let me switch out the CFO, let me switch out this person, let me change, but you don't change the interactions yes. um, between the individuals and also between how the roles operate, then you don't actually change the behavior of the system. So that's where culture comes in. So I think definitely the concentration on yeah. how you build a culture in which the utility actually performs in the way that you want it to perform. Thank you. I'm sorry, you came from Jamaica. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, please. Drew, just, uh, just the last one. I'm George from Mitsubishi Electric, and it's my first time. I live here in Austin, but it was uh, Thank mind, you for mind bong uh, bonging and uh, a jewel of the minds, probably the best minds I've seen uh, in my experience as an engineer, uh, and uh, a brainstorming. But I think that we have uh, not looked at ourselves. And my, my, question, my question is, sorry, uh, are there enough resources to sustain this uh, chaos, and uh, I, was, I, was, I would look at it as a revolution. Are there enough resources that are not taken away from this industry and they might go to other industries and so on? I mean, are we confident enough that we can sustain this into the future? I, I feel, like, I feel like there's some fatalism year. in the subtext of that, so I'll, I'll uh, as an eternal optimist fatalist, I feel your dynamic, I'm very much there with you. Uh, I personally, when I'm home alone, I read a lot of fact-based articles that terrify me, and I go out there every day and I tell people why we need to work together. So I get you on that. 
but me personally, man, the fact that we're all here, yeah, absolutely. The amount of conversations for people that got changed for, in ETS 14, ETS Raleigh, ETS 15, ETS Chicago, this, and we didn't even get to announce yet, but we're rolling out ETS Houston in September, and we're gonna be bringing that untold story of the energy, engineering, and finance to the capital of en energy so that they know their impact on everyone. And they don't have any confusion about what we need from them as a society. So you're right. Some of this is, I'll tell you, as a culture, our company, we demand a lot of ourselves. I mean, Peter demands a lot of himself, and y'all do too. And so it is only right for us to expect more of our community. As I said, Martin Luther King said, I can only do as well as I do if you only do as well as you do. So, as Barack Obama said, it's not me, it's you. We really need, yes, we can, but it takes everyone, and that's not a political message. It really is just a message of figuring it out. <laughs> that's God's way of telling us it's time to It's yeah. over. <laughs> Thank so you, guys. Yes. Appreciate you.